our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this special CUBE Conversation with a remote guest, Steve Herod, Managing Director of General Kennelis. He's a venture capitalist, former uh, CTO of VMware, CUBE alumni, uh, Steve, welcome to this special CUBE conversation coming in remote from Palo Alto. You're right across town, but still, we <laughs> wanted to grab you. Big news happening and also get your thoughts on VMworld 2019. Welcome to our remote conversation. Yeah, hey John, yeah, we're close and yet this makes it even more convenient. This yeah, is cool. We love the new format of bring people in no matter where they are, no matter what, whatever it takes to get the stories, we we'll want to do that. And, and two important ones, obviously happening, we, we know VMworld's coming next week, but uh, congratulations in order to you and your portfolio company, Signal FX, another CUBE alumni firm we've been covering since the beginning of their funding, uh, acquisition mm -hmm. by Splunk today for over a billion dollars, 60% in cash and 40% in stock. Congratulations. Uh, you've been on the board, you've, you've known these guys from VMware, quite a team, quite an exit, it's a win-win for those guys. Congratulations. Yeah, great great group of guys, several of which were at VMware, as you as you mentioned, and as you've had on your show. Um, that's great, they were doing a really good job of monitoring and getting metrics about applications and how they're doing it, and they're marrying it with Splunk's ability to ingest logs and really understand operational data, and I think the combination will be very powerful. It brings kind of what we've been calling cloud 2.0, essentially monitoring 2.0 is really observability. As the world starts moving into the, the kinds of services we're seeing with cloud and on-premises operations, more than ever that game has changed. It's much more dynamic and the security impact is significant. And certainly as, as applications connect, whether it's IOT or any IP device, having that data at scale is really a critical part of that. And I know SignalFX was one of those companies where you invested early. And I remember interviewing them a couple of years ago and saying, damn, these guys might be too early. I mean, they're so smart, they're so on it. But this is an example of skating to where the puck is, as Wayne Kretzky would say. These guys were just hitting their stride, Steve. Can you, can you share any color commentary on, on the deal and or you know, why this is so important? Well, they've, they've been at this for a long time and, and they're a great team. I've been involved as an investor, less time obviously. Um, but you know, it was the really original team out of Facebook monitoring really at scale applications and, and then trying to take that technology that Facebook could use and apply it to our world. And uh, you know, as you just covered, we're in a world of microservices and containers and that is definitely hitting its stride right now. And so they were in the right place knowing how to monitor this very fast moving information and, and make some sense out of it. So yeah, really good job on their part. And it was a pleasure to be along for part of the ride with them. Yeah, you know, it's great to meet great founders that have a vision and stay the course. Because you know, it, it always, it's always tricky when you're early to see the future, especially around. They were talking microservices and containers way back before it became the rage, and now more relevant mm -hmm. operationally uh, for enterprises. Um, it's easy to get distracted and go, "Oh man, it's fashion. I'll just jump on this trend or this wave." They stayed the course. They stayed the nose to the grindstone. And now observability, which to me is code word for monitoring 2.0, is probably one of the mm -hmm. hottest segments. You saw um, companies going public, uh, companies filing the pager duty, um, Dynatrace. Um, now, the, um, you guys with your acquisition with Signal FX, this is an important sector. This would normally be viewed in the IT world as kind of just a white space, but it seems to be a much bigger landscape. Can you comment on your view on this and why it's so important? Why is observability so hot, Steve? Well, it's been, this has actually been a great market to be in for quite a while. There've been a large number of companies uh, continuing to be built, built up. And yeah, it's pretty simple. The amount of e-commerce or the amount of customer interactions you're having over applications and over the web has gone up. And so anything that's not performing well or has downtime literally costs you a lot of money as a company. And so as these applications get more complex and they're being relied on more for revenue and for customer interactions, you know, simply you have to have better tools. And, and that's going to be something that continues to evolve. <laughs> We're going to have more complex apps and more commerce is going to go through them. Complexity is obviously something that people, a lot of people are talking about. I want to ask you something around today's marketplace, but I want you to, to compare and contrast it. Similarly to what your experience was at VMware when you were the CTO, you know, virtualization evolved very, very quickly uh, and ended up becoming a really critical component of the infrastructure. And a lot of people were poo-pooing that initially at first, and then all of a sudden it became, oh, we got to kill VMware. And, you know, so the resiliency <laughs> of VMware was such that they continue to innovate on virtualization. 
Um, and so that's been you know, part of the legacy of, of VMware and, and, and VMware, which we'll cover next, next week. But when you look at uh, what's happening now with cloud computing and now some of the uh, hybrid cloud op opportunities with microservices and other, other cool things, the, the role of the application is being, is, a, is an important part of the equation. It used to be the stand up infrastructure and that would enable the application to do things. Virtualization kind of changed that game. Now, you don't need to stand up any infrastructure. You can just deploy an application and the infrastructure can be code and be self-formed. So you can have unique requirements as infrastructure driven by the application. The whole world seemed to have flipped around. Do you see it that way? Is that accurate assessment? What's your thoughts on that? I, I think you're right on a bunch of fronts. Um, people have been calling it different things, but the, the beauty of VMware, and, and you know, this is a while ago now, but the reason it was successful is that you didn't have to change any of your software to use it. it sort of slid in underneath and added value. Um, but at the same time, applications evolve. And so the, uh, the, the path of looking like hardware was something that was great for not changing applications. You have to think about it a little differently when people are taking advantage of new application patterns or new services that are in the cloud. And as you build up these, you know, as they're called cloud native applications, um, it really is about the infrastructure. You know, its job in life is to run applications. And it, it, it sort of felt like the other way around. It used to be you wrote an application for what your infrastructure was. Uh, it shouldn't be like that anymore. It's about what, what you need to do to get the job done. And so we see the evolution of the clouds and their services that are there. Uh, certainly the notion of containers and a lot of the stuff that VMware is now doing has been focused on those new applications and making sure VMware adds value to them, uh, whatever type of application they are. It's interesting, one of the exciting things in this um, wave that we're on this year around multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, and public cloud, now that we've kind of crossed over to the reality that public cloud has been there, done that, succeeded, I call that cloud 1.0. You saw the emergence of hybrid cloud, even early on around 2012, 2013, we were talking about that at VMworld, uh, you know, certainly Pat Gelsinger, but now you're seeing hybrid cloud validated, you got Outpost, you got uh, Azure Stack, among other things. The reality is if you are cloud native, you might not need to have anything on premise, like companies like ours with 50 plus people. We don't have an IT department, but most enterprises mm -hmm. have stuff on premise. So the, the nuance these days is around, you know, what's the architecture of, of IT these days? When you add security into it, it's complicated. So there's debates, can there be a sole cloud for a workload? Certainly that's been something that we've been covering with the Amazon Jedi contract where it's not necessarily a sole cloud for the entire Department of Defense, it's a sole cloud for the workload, the military application workload or app, the military, uh, it's $10 billion application. And it's okay to have one cloud, as we would say, but yet they're going to use Microsoft's cloud for other things. So the DOD is having a multiple cloud approach, multiple environments, multiple vendors, if you will, but you don't have to split the cloud up per se. This is kind of one of those conversations that's really evolving quickly because there's no real school of thought around this other than the old way, which was have a multi-vendor environment, split the things. What's your thoughts on the, the, uh, the, the workload relationship to the cloud? Is it okay to have a workload, have a single cloud for that workload and coexist with other clouds? It's funny, I've, I've been thinking about this more lately where if you went back earlier in time, uh, forgetting cloud, there used to be a lot of different type of servers that you could run on, whether it be a, a mainframe or a mini mainframe or a Unix system or a Linux system. Um, and to some extent, people were choosing what would run where based on the demands of the application, sometimes on price, sometimes on certifications, or even what's been ported to the right one. Um, so this is, I'm dating myself, but you know, that's, that's a while ago. But it's not too different to kind of think about the different kind of cloud services that are out there, whether you're running your own on your own data center or whether you're leveraging one from the other partners. Um, I, I really do think in the ideal world, you get your choice of the best possible platform for the application across a, a variety of characteristics. And it's kind of up to the vendors of management software and monitoring software and security software to give you more flexibility to, to choose where to run. And so forgetting VMware exactly, but think of a virtualization layer that, that really tries to abstract out and let you more fluidly run things on different clouds. I, I do think that's where a lot of the, um, you know, the, the core software is headed these days to, to really enable that to work better. And a million other use cases with, with you know, storage being moved around for disaster recovery or for whatever it else might be. But that core flexibility reminds me a lot of you know, choosing what application would one run would run where within your own company. And the Kubernetes trend in containers certainly really makes that so much more flexible because you can still run 
VMware's on, VMs, VMs under the covers or put stuff on bare metal. A lot of great opportunities, so it's exciting. Uh, and, and you slap an API on front of them and, and you know, microservices sort of works in tandem with that so that you, you could really have your application composed across multiple environments. And I think the observability, observability is so hot because it takes what network management was doing in the old way, which is monitoring, making sure things are operating effectively and combining with data. And so when I heard about the acquisition of SignalFX um, um, uh, into uh, Splunk, I'm like, there it is, we're back to data. So observability is really a data challenge and opportunity for using what would be a white space monitoring, but it's more than monitoring because it's about the data and the efficacy of that data and how it's being used, whether it's for security or whatever, your thoughts. So there's more data than ever for sure. And so being able to stream that in, being able to capture it at, at cost, all that is a big part of our, you know, the environments we all work in. The key thing is turning that into some actionable insight and whether you're using um, you know, interesting calculations for that or, or different forms of machine learning, like that's where this really has to go is with all this data coming in, how do I avoid false, you know, false positives? How do I only uh, alert people when needed? And then that allows you to do what everyone's talked about for 30 years, which is yeah. uh, automatic remediation. But for now, let's talk about it as how do I process all of this rich data and get me the right information to take action. Steve, I want to thank you for coming on this remote um, CUBE conversation. You've been with us at theCUBE since um, 2010. I think our first CUBE event was EMC World 2010. That show doesn't yeah. exist any longer because that folded into Dell Technologies World. So VMworld next week is the last show standing that has been around since the Cube. Cube's been around. Of course, you guys had, VMworld's had their 10th anniversary, I think it was 2013 as a show. But this is our 10th year. I want to thank you for being part of our community and being a contributor uh, with your commentary and, and your friendship and uh, referral, appreciate all that. So I got to ask you, looking back over the 10 years since you've been with the Cube, VMworld, what's the most exciting moments? What are moments that you can say, hey, that was an amazing time, that was a grind, but we got through it. Uh, funny moments, your thoughts. Yeah. Boy, that's a tough question. I've, I've enjoyed you know, working with you, John, in theCUBE. Um, there have been so many really interesting things. For me, the, some of the big acquisitions that we went through at VMware were, I, I think the NSX acquisition when we get Nasira, I think that really pushed us in an interesting spot. But we had gone through uh, IPOs and acquisitions ourselves by EMC. <laughs> we had gone through um, some pretty vicious competition from whether it be Citrix or Zen or Microsoft. Um, yeah, that's just the joy of being at these companies is lots of ups and downs along the way. Um, but they all kind of fit together to make an exciting life. What were some moments for you? I know you had left, was it 2015 or 26? What was your last day at VMware? Yeah, six, World six years ago now. So. Yeah, about six years. What do you miss about uh, VMware? Uh, the team is, is what everyone kind of cliche says, but it's totally true. Uh, the chance to kind of work with all those people um, at the executive staff, all the way down to like these awesome engineers with cool ideas. So I definitely miss that. Um, I miss shipping products. You don't get to do that as much directly <laughs> as, a, yeah. as a venture capitalist. But, um, but on the flip side, this is a great world to be in. I get to see enthusiastic, you know, very optimistic founders all day long pushing the envelope. And while that was existing at VMware, uh, it's it's what I see every single day here. You've been on the Cube ten times at VMworld. Um, that's the all-time spot. You're tied for first. Congratulations on the leaderboard. <laughs> well, it's been a great ten years. Going forward, we've seen. Um, or so go, looking back, I would say that you know um, Paul Moritz taking over from Diane Green really set the table. He actually laid out essentially what. I think now is a clearly a cloud SaaS architecture. I think he got that pretty much right. Again, or maybe early in certain spots of what he proposed at that time, there was some things that didn't materialize as fast, but ultimately from a core perspective, you guys got that right. Um, and then went in, tried to do the cloud, but then Nasira comes in for software defined, you align with Amazon. And since that time, the stock has been really kind of up to the right. So, you know, some key moments there uh, for VMware from some, some All really kinds important. Of stuff. It's fun to see Pivotal now possibly coming back in too after <laughs> after getting started there, but I, I think uh, you know there's there's a hugely talented team of executives there. Pat Gelsinger's come in and done a great job. I think Ragu and all these folks that are in there are, are good thinkers, and so uh, I think you'll consider to continue to see it evolve quite a bit, and probably some cool announcements next week. Talk about the role Ragu and the team play because he doesn't really get a lot of. Um, 
on the spotlight. He avoids it. I know he. I've talked to him privately about <laughs> it. He won't come on the queue. Oh no, let the other guys go on. Other guys and gals. So he's been instrumental. He was really critical in multiple deals. Could you share some insight into his role at VM, VMware and why it's been so important? Well, I'll push him to get on, especially now that you have remote, you can probably grab him. But <laughs> no, he and Rajiv and uh, and Ray O'Farrell just. All the guys are, um, I think he and Rajiv basically split up half and half of the products, but uh, I know Raghu is very, very seminal in the whole cloud strategy that has clearly been working well. Uh, he's a good friend and a very smart guy. Well, I want you to, to give me a personal word that you're going to get him in a headlock and tell him to come on theCUBE this year. We want <laughs> him on, he's a great, uh, Great, great guest, and he's certainly knowledgeable. Going forward, Steve, 10 years out, we've still got 10 more years of great change coming. If you look at the wave that's coming, you're out investing in companies. Again, you had one big exit today with a billion dollar acquisition that was uh, happened by Splunk and SignalFX. A lot more action, you've been investing in security. What's your outlook as you look at the next 10 years? Is a lot more action to happen? We seem to be early days in this new modern era a historic time in the computer industry as applications are now dictating infrastructure capabilities. There's still a lot more to do. What are you excited about? Oh man, there's there's a million things I get to see every day which are clearly where the world is headed. But I think at the end of the day, there's, there's infrastructure, which the job and life of infrastructure is to run applications. And so then you look at applications, how are they changing and, and what is the underlying fabric going to need to do to support them? And if you look at the future of applications, it's clearly some amazing things around um, artificial intelligence and machine learning to actually make them smarter. It's all different factors, uh, form factors that they're running on and being displayed on. Uh, I think we clearly have a world where uh, with the next generation of networking, you can do even more at the edge and, and communicate in a very different way with the back end. So I kind of look at all these application patterns and really try to think about what is the change to the underlying clouds and fabrics and, and compute that's going to be needed to run them. I think we have <laughs> plenty of headroom a, of interesting ideas ahead. Stu, Dave and I were talking, Stu, Dave, Stu, Dave Vellante, Stu Miniman and I were talking about, you know, as infrastructure and cloud get automated, as automation comes in, new waves are going to be formed from it. What new waves do you see? Is it like RPA, is it AI? I mean, because as those things <laughs> get sucked in, the shifts to new waves. What are the, some of the key ways people should pay attention to? I'm not saying the infrastructure is going away, but as it becomes automated and as the shift happens, the value still is there. Where is those new waves? Well, at the end of the day, it looks like most applications are going to be composed of a lot of services, um, and I think they're going to be able, they're going to need to be displaying on everything from big screens to small screens to purely as uh, headless API front ends. And so again, I think at the end of the day, this this infrastructure is going to have to have a lot of computation capability, have to crunch through tons of data but also have to stitch together these connections between components and provide uh, really good experiences and predictability in the network. And all those are very hard problems that we've been working on for a while. I think we're going to keep working on them in new forms for the next 10 years at least. Awesome. Steve, thanks for being a friend with us on theCUBE. What's your funny favorite moment of theCUBE? Can you share any observations about theCUBE um, and your experiences, your observations over the 10 years? We've come a long way. You've come a long way. Actually, I've enjoyed, I mean, it's a microcosm of, of all the other stuff going on, but I saw your first little box that you built and used for the cube. Like that was, that was really cool. <laughs> but now the fact that I'm on my laptop, you know, doing this over the network and it's, it's showing up is, is pretty awesome. So I think you're following the same patterns of the other, <laughs> of the other applications moving to the cloud and having good user experiences. Cube native here, software, it's going to be all cube native. Cube native. Yeah. Steve, thank you so much for staying the time commenting on the acquisition. I know it's fresh on the press. A lot more analysis to come next week. It's certainly, I'll be co-hosting at splunks.conf uh, later in the year. So I'm looking forward to connecting with the team there. And again, thanks for all your contribution into the CUBE community. We really appreciate it. I want to thank you for your time. Thanks, John. You guys are awesome. Thanks for uh, chatting. Okay, Steve Herod, Managing Director at General Counsel, top tier VC from here in Silicon Valley and they have offices around the world. I'm John Furrier, breaking down the news as well as a VMworld preview with the former CTO of VMware, Steve Herod, now a big time venture capitalist. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. <laughs>